Good afternoon and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to have you with us, whether you're here in the McGowan Theater or joining us on our YouTube station. Before we hear from Kate Anderson Brower about her new book, First in Line, Presidents, Vice Presidents, and the Pursuit of Power, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up here in the McGowan Theater. On Wednesday, August 1st at noon, Lynn Vincent and Sarah Vladek will be here to tell us about their new book, Indianapolis, The True Story of the Worst Sea Disaster in U.S. Naval History and the 50-Year Fight to Exonerate an Innocent Man. During World War II, the Indianapolis crew was left adrift at sea for five days after being torpedoed, torpedoed by a Japanese sub. And for 50 years, the survivors fought for justice and the exoneration of their wrongfully court-martialed captain. Later on Tuesday, uh, September 11th, uh, at noon, Sean Wallentz will speak about his latest book, No Property in Man, Slavery and Anti-Slavery at the Nation's Founding, about the political and legal struggles over slavery that began during the Revolution and concluded with the Civil War. Check out our website, archives.gov, or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates. You'll find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach work, and there are applications for membership outside also. The presidential libraries operated by the National Archives and Records Administration contain unparalleled resources for, um, for American presidencies since the 1930s. The libraries cover the administrations of all presidents since Herbert Hoover and preserve the records of not just the chief executive, but his family and his administration. Although often described as just a heartbeat away from the highest office, the vice presidency for much of US history often seemed like an afterthought. Early on in his second term as first vice president of the United States, John Adams expressed his frustration to his wife, Abigail. My country has in its wisdom contrived for me the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. For many decades after Adams, several vice presidents would have agreed. In the 20th century though, ideas about the role of vice president began to change and after World War II, the office was viewed as more consequential. Today we've gathered to hear about the change, that change and how recent presidents and vice presidents have worked together. In her latest book, First in Line, Kate Anderson Brower looks at 13 modern vice presidents, eight Republicans and five Democrats, from Richard Nixon to Mike Pence. Kate Anderson Brower is a CNN contributor who also covered Barack Obama's first term in the White House for Bloomberg News. She's a former CBS News staffer and Fox News producer. She's written for the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Time, The Washington Post, and Bloomberg Business Week, and is the author of two previous books, The Residents, Inside the Private World of the White House, and First Women, The Grace and Power of America's Modern First Ladies. Both books were on the New York Times bestseller list, and The Residents is now being turned into a new Netflix series. While her earlier books took the reader inside the lives of the White House staff and gave us an in-depth look at the modern first ladies, in first in line, Brower introduces us to the second most powerful men in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kate Anderson Brower. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you uh, David Ferriero and Doug Swanson. I have done a lot of work here in the archives and I really appreciate uh, what you do to preserve American history and help journalists and authors learn more about our past. Um, if you haven't done it, the research room is really, really interesting and, and you get to just handle carefully uh, a lot of incredible letters uh, and, and documents from the past and it's really amazing. Um, so I've written, as David said, I've written three books about the White House, and I want to talk about First in Line, my latest book that came out June 5th. 
Um, but my first book, The Residence, is about the, the staff at the White House. And I kind of view these three books as a, a trilogy a bit. You know, the first book is about the maids and butlers. The second book is about the first ladies. Um, and the third book is about the people who stand behind the president, the vice presidency. So it's looking at history from a different perspective, through the eyes of the White House staff, through the eyes of um, the women married to the president, and then to the person who's supposed to succeed the president, um, and also be a support and just do uh, what he wants uh, when he wants it. And I think that one of the things about the vice presidency that's so interesting is looking at someone like Joe Biden, who I covered as a reporter, and here's someone who ran himself and lost, and what is it like working for someone who beat you? And um, I just thought the psychology behind it was especially fascinating. My book, The Residence, I decided to do when I was a Bloomberg reporter. Um, we had a lunch with First Lady Michelle Obama. At the time, she invited about a dozen female reporters to this lunch, and in and out of the lunch, um, butlers came in and served us. And it was just fascinating to me to see she, she knew this butler by his first name. And as a White House reporter, we never get to see this side um, of the White House. So it was incredible um, and kind of opened my eyes to these people who work behind the scenes at the White House. And it's really like Downton Abbey at the White House. It's a um, hundred people. These are maids, these are butlers, these are um, florists, chefs, ushers. Um, it's an incredible effort. Here's a photo from a 1976 state dinner. Um, on the far right of this photo is Eugene Allen, and I don't know if any of you saw the butler, but it's based on his life. And I interviewed his son because he had passed away by the time I was working on this book. And he said, you know, my dad was pretty boring. They really had to make him much more interesting. Like, he was a nice, good guy. So if you see the movie, Oprah Winfrey plays his mom, and she's an alcoholic. And they definitely uh, spiced up what was just a really sweet man. Um, and they have a lot of respect for the families they serve. I'll just go through these briefly because this is by, it all, it all wraps into, um, one kind of cohesive look at the presidency, I hope. Uh, this is Jackie Kennedy with the butlers. Um, this is uh, after her husband was killed, so this is his funeral, uh, the day of his funeral. She's standing next to Preston Bruce, the man with um, white hair, and he was incredibly close to the Kennedy family. And when Jackie returned with her husband's um, coffin after he was killed in Dallas, he Preston Bruce and Jackie and Robert Kennedy cried together in the White House elevator. And I just thought that was incredible, the relationships between the staff. Uh, this is one of the butlers who I interviewed. And in all my books, I try to go out and interview the, the source uh, of all the information. So for First in Line, I talked to all six living former vice presidents. For the book about the resident staff, I went out and interviewed um, over 50 resident staffers. And it's amazing how how important it is to them to protect the privacy of the White House. They're very discreet, they don't say much, but what they do say is really interesting. Um, here's Mary Prince, who was the Carter's nanny, and she's here with Mary, uh, Mary is here with Amy, the Carter's daughter on the White House South Lawn. And the incredible thing about Mary is that she was actually in prison for murder, and the Carter's uh, loved her so much. She was working at the governor's mansion in Georgia that they they thought she was unfairly convicted. Um, it was in the South in the 60s at the time uh, when she was convicted. She was African American, did not have good legal representation. And so um, they helped get her conviction overturned and brought her to be uh, Amy's nanny, which is an incredible story. And Jimmy Carter was her parole officer for a period of time, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, Here's uh, George H.W. Bush playing with one of the, um, the housekeepers at the White House. The male housekeepers are called housemen. It's kind of an interesting position where they move the heavy furniture so the maids can, um, can vacuum and work around them. And they played horseshoes every week, multiple times a week. Barbara Bush told me it was so competitive, it was like a political primary. <laughs> they got really into the to horseshoes. And Barbara Bush also told me, and she had a great dry wit, she said when she left the White House, one of the things she was most upset about losing to the Clintons was because she knew they would get rid of the horseshoe pit. And I'm sure there were other reasons she was upset that they lost. Um, <laughs> 
here she is with one of florists who I interviewed. There are these really cool uh, shops underneath the White House. It looks like the White House looks like three levels, but it's actually um, six. There are underground levels. Um, there are lockers for butlers. There are, you know, the chef's kitchen. This is the flower shop, a carpenter shop, an electrician shop. It's just a fascinating kind of underground world there that people don't know much about. Um, here are the Clintons saying goodbye to the staff. Every uh, inauguration day, our eyes are trained on the Capitol for the swearing-in ceremony. But I think what happens at the White House is much more interesting. It's, it's the President and the First Lady and their children saying goodbye to the people who they've grown uh, to know and love for at least four years, if not eight. And there's usually not a dry eye in the room. Um, here's James Ramsey, who was a beloved butler with George W. Bush. The Bushes loved James so much that when he passed away, Laura Bush flew from Texas to D.C. to give the eulogy at his funeral. Um, so that just gives you some sense of how genuine these relationships really are. And I'm in touch with some of the staff at the White House now. And it's like, it's amazing because they are so devoted to the job. Um, some of them are Democrats, some of them are Republicans. They don't care who's in office, they're there to serve the presidency, which is a special thing, I think. Um, here is the staff. On, uh, this is actually on President Obama's inauguration day. This is George W. Bush saying goodbye to the staff. And you see that flag there is being given to him. It is the flag that flew on his first full day in office and on his last full day in office. And the staff actually have a carpenter's shop and the carpenters make the box and present it to every president when they leave. Uh, Stephen Rochon was the chief usher. The chief usher is like a general manager of the White House. Here he is with Barack Obama. Uh, Steve told me that sometimes Obama would get frustrated about the water pressure, you know, in his in his bathroom and kind of small things like that. And that's what he'd hear about occasionally. He also got upset that the basketball court was taking a long time to. Um, to convert the tennis court into the basketball court was taking a long time. So it's little things like that 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 they. Uh, interact with the family about. Here's Michelle Obama and George Haney, who was a butler very close to the Obamas. In fact, his wife became friends with Michelle Obama's mother, who lived in the White House. And they would um, occasionally, George told me that his wife was worried about Marion Robinson being lonely. She lived in a suite on the third floor. So um, his wife would take her out to local shopping malls and go out to lunch. And he wouldn't tell me where they went for security reasons, but it kind of gives you a little sense of what this is like living in the White House and feeling so isolated. Uh, this is my second book on First Ladies. Um, the reason I did the First Ladies book is that when I was working on the residence, Whenever a decision came from the second floor, it meant it came from the first lady. And I thought that was interesting because the second floor of the White House, of course, is uh, the residence where their uh, private living quarters are. Um, there are some wonderful stories about Pat Nixon, Mamie Eisenhower, Lady Bird, Jackie Kennedy. Um, I really got into the friendships and rivalries in the book. Um, Jackie Kennedy with her children. Uh, she said, you know, if you bungle raising your children, nothing else you do matters very much. Um, and I think the stories and the relationships between her children and their nanny, Maud Shaw, and also um, Jackie set up a kindergarten on the solarium the third floor of the White House for Caroline. And after Kennedy was killed, um, Caroline would come back and forth just to finish out that last few weeks of school before Christmas. And one of the staffers who was still alive when I was working on this book and has unfortunately passed away, he told me what it was like watching Caroline come back and how important it felt to the staff that, that she was trying to like lead her life as it had been before and how emotional it was for them to see her coming back. Um, Betty Ford did this on her last, her husband's last day in office. She said it was as close as she would get to a seat at the table, so she jumped up. Uh, she was a Martha Graham trained dancer. 
Uh, I know that's not the subject of my talk today, but I am passionate about First Lady, so I will scooch through these pretty fast. Uh, Rosalind Carter and Jimmy Carter. Rosalind actually just went down to talk to the Carters a few weeks ago in Plains, Georgia, um, and they are really incredible. Jimmy Carter still does a Bible study down in this tiny town in Georgia, um, and they are still working for Habitat for Humanity, and she um, actually instituted this weekly lunch with her husband because she would, when he would get off the elevator on the second floor residence after a long day at work, she would come running up to him with a list of things to talk about and he said, you know what, let's just do lunch every week. So she's very determined um, to know what she was, uh, what she was talking about. Uh, here is Lady Bird and Barbara Bush. I will just read you a really quick thing because I think it's hysterical. Um, Lady Bird Johnson, uh, LBJ's wife, really put up with a lot from Lyndon Johnson. He was very difficult to please. And in the White House, um, one little story I have in one of my books, uh, he wanted the water pressure at the White House to be just like his shower at home, which was the equivalent of a fire hose. And he wanted a simple switch to change the temperature from hot to cold immediately and never warm. So he basically had the resident staff tied up in knots for years trying to get the shower just right. Uh, I interviewed the head plumber's wife because he had passed away and she said that he had a nervous breakdown over it and had to be hospitalized. The Kennedys had never complained about the shower, so the engineers were at a loss. A team was sent to the Elms, that's their home in DC, this is before vice presidents had um, official residences is before the observatory, which is where the vice president lives now. And so the Johnsons had lived at the Elms, which is this beautiful house in northwest Washington. Um, and they went to increase the water pressure and heat there to nearly scalding temperatures. We ended up with four pumps, and then we had to increase the size of our water lines because the other parts of the house were being sucked dry, said the head butler. If I can move 10,000 troops in a day, you can certainly fix the bathroom any way I want it, Johnson would howl. And I asked his daughter about this, and she confirmed. She said, listen, my father was dealing with so much pressure. One of life's simple pleasures is a, a warm shower, and so um, he should get what he wants. And yet, as soon as Lyndon Johnson was gone from the White House, his shower was too. Richard Nixon took one look at the elaborate setup and said, get rid of this stuff. So these little things, I think, and what I try to ha do with all three of these books is kind of give insight into what, the, what these people are really like on a very human level. Um, here are uh, Betty Ford, Lady Bird Johnson, Rosalind Carter. This is at the Johnson Ranch, and it's a great photo because as the tour bus was going by, people on the bus didn't realize that three first ladies were going to be sitting out front. So it was an amazing moment, and all the cameras started flashing. Um, and they were all genuinely friends. Um, I was fortunate to get to interview Barbara Bush, uh, Rosalind Carter, and, um, and Laura Bush from my book. Hillary Clinton was running for office at the time, so it was not something she necessarily wanted to talk about very much because she has at, had at that time really transitioned into a really very political role, but um, I do have stories about the Clintons in all my books about their, her friendships with us, particularly the women um, housekeepers in the residence. Um, I, there's some really interesting stories about that uh, dynamic. Uh, when I was a White House reporter for Bloomberg News, I covered Joe Biden, and one of the trips I got to make was to Mongolia with him. Um, and it was great because he really, it, he really was very, um, he would talk um, off the cuff a lot, and sometimes his staff would have to, to rein him in. Um, and that's one of the things that I think people like best about Joe Biden, is that he is willing to be so honest and upfront, and sometimes that does get him in trouble. Um, the most famous quote on the vice presidency is not so nice. The vice presidency is not worth a, warm, a bucket of warm spit said John Nance Garner, who is FDR's vice president, and he really said something else. They had to clean it up to warm spit. Um, you can imagine. Um, another, this is from Thomas R. Marshall, who was vice president under President Woodrow Wilson. Once there were two brothers. One ran away to sea, the other was elected vice president, and nothing was ever heard from either of them again. 
So the vice president, here, here's Walter Mondale, one of the most important vice presidents in modern history. There are really only two constitutional responsibilities. They're president of the Senate, so they uh, do tie-breaking votes. Mike Pence has had several, Joe Biden had none, so I'm sure he's not too happy about that. Um, and of course, to succeed to the presidency. Um, the 25th Amendment was ratified in 1967, several years after uh, JFK's assassination, to help make the rules of succession uh, more clear because they weren't always so clear. Uh, Fourteen vice presidents have become president. Eight of them ascended to the highest office because of the death of the sitting president. Only four men, so far all men, have successfully run for president as sitting vice president. So this is John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Martin Van Buren, and George H.W. Bush. So that is a small number of uh, men who were able to make that jump directly from the vice presidency to the presidency. And when I interviewed Al Gore, we talked a bit about it, and it seemed that he made the point um, that it's very hard to offer change to people. You know, after eight years of one president, it's very, vice presidents have a really hard time of um, making it seem as though they're offering something different. Usually, as we've seen historically, there is a change in party, um, as we saw with this last election, and it's very rare uh, to have what happened with Reagan and Bush, which was after eight years of a Republican, um, you, you get another Republican, and part of that had to do with Bush um, really was able to capitalize on Ronald Reagan's popularity towards the end. Ronald Reagan wasn't always as popular as people I think since uh, assume there were times with the economy at the beginning of his term that were very difficult, his polling numbers were not always great. But towards the end, they were wonderful. And George H.W. Bush was able to use that. Um, and I interviewed George H.W. Bush, and he was so typically um, so humble. I asked him what his greatest accomplishment was as vice president, and he said, history will have to judge. Um, and then I asked him what his favorite memory was of Ronald Reagan and their eight years together. And he described uh, after Reagan was shot, visiting Reagan at the hospital and finding the President of the United States on his hands and knees cleaning up a spill of water on the floor because he didn't want the, maids, uh, the nurses to have to do it. And I think that just says a lot about Ronald Reagan and this kind of, um, just the kind of person that he, he was. Um, so when Bush was able to, to finally break this, this kind of unfortunate uh, run of bad luck for vice presidents, um, he said, it's been a long time, Marty, at his first news conference after the 1988 election. It was the last time that an a incumbent vice president won the presidency was in 1836. Richard Nixon, of course, won um, in 1968, but that was eight years after he served as vice president, so there was a chunk of time between them. When the Founding Fathers gathered in Philadelphia in 1787 to write the Constitution, the Vice Presidency was not at the center of their attention. Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution states that the Vice President will preside over the Senate but shall have no vote unless they may be equally divided. The Founding Fathers were wary of anything resembling a monarchy. And they were concerned that a president may become too powerful if the vice president had any role in the Senate greater than serving as a tiebreaker, so his job was kept purposefully small. The line between the executive and legislative branches of government should not be blurred, and too much power was not to be concentrated in the White House. So while a vice president can sit in the presiding officer's chair, he still cannot speak on the Senate floor without permission, which I think is very interesting. Um, during the earliest years of the country, a run, the runner-up was the vice president. So it explains why John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were the nation's first two vice presidents and its second and third presidents. Uh, the system was very complicated and it led to a president and vice president from two different po political parties being elected. In 1796, Adams, who was a Federalist, was elected president and Jefferson, a Democratic Republican, was the runner up and therefore became Adams vice president. Adams never consulted Jefferson on important national issues and Jefferson used his time as vice president to secure his place as leader of his party. So this system in the earliest years of our country was really untenable. 
Uh, the presidential election of 1800 was another bitter contest contest that in the end changed the way a vice president is elected. Instead of becoming vice president as a result of the presidential vote, the next vice president would assume office as part of a party slate. In 1804, the Twelfth Amendment was adopted, recognizing the reality of political parties and dictating that each elector cast separate votes for president and vice president. So the vice presidency over time became more and more important. In 1940, FDR only agreed to seek a third term as president if he could pick Henry Wallace as his running mate. His demand that party convention delegates go along with his decision changed the way vice presidents were chosen. And since 1960, almost every presidential candidate has named his running mate either at his party's national convention or a few days before. What Walter Mondale, Jimmy Carter's vice president, did uh, to change the vice presidency is really interesting, and it's not partisan at all. Of course, he's a Democrat, but um, other pre vice presidents, including Mike Pence, have talked to Walter Mondale and sought his advice on this. Walter Mondale insisted on a weekly uh, unstaffed lunches with the president. He wanted to see every piece of paper that came across the president's desk. He wanted to um, have his staff, who were on a similar uh, parallel vice presidential staff be included in meetings uh, with the president's staff, and he wanted a West Wing office. And so he was really responsible for changing the vice presidency and strengthening it. And since then, every vice president, maybe with the exception of Cheney, who had his own ideas about the vice presidency, have reached out to Mondale. Um, Cheney was, so one reason why I started with Nixon and Eisenhower is they had a very difficult relationship. I always think that's interesting. Um, although as years go on, this is harder to say, but I like to do modern uh, White Houses because you can talk to people who were alive. And so that's why I typically have started with the Kennedys because there are still people who worked for the Kennedys who are alive, although that is uh, changing every day. Um, Dick Cheney, I thought would be the hardest interview to get and he was one of the easiest interviews to get for the book and he was very, very um, forthcoming about his time in the White House and how he really did have a situation where his first term he was very powerful, his second term his power really waned. And we talked a bit about Scooter Libby who was um, his chief of staff and he of course was very upset that Scooter wasn't pardoned. Um, and since then Donald Trump has pardoned Scooter Libby. So I have to wonder and I've asked but not gotten an answer about it how influential Cheney was in that because Dick Cheney and Mike Pence do talk. Um, Joe Biden told me that he talks with Mike Pence at least once a month, um, about usually about foreign policy, which I thought was really interesting. Um, of course, Donald Trump and Barack Obama have not talked since the inauguration, so I think it's fascinating that on a vice presidential level there is communication. Um, and Joe Biden said, you know, the King of Jordan will come and helicopter to his house in Wilmington to talk about foreign policy. Of course, that makes Joe Biden look good and like he's still engaged, but Pence's staff did confirm that that is true, that there is um, a dialogue uh, where Mike Pence will ask what the precedent has been on a certain policy before usually having to do with foreign policy. Going back, you know, Harry Truman had no idea about the atomic bomb when FDR suddenly passed away. I have uh, a sort of narrative in the sequence in the book of how shocking that was uh, for Truman and how a lot of vice presidents, and when I talked to Jimmy Carter for first in line, he said, look at what happened to Harry Truman. I didn't want my vice president to end up like that. He needed to know everything that I knew. Um, in fact, Biden and Obama agreed to five ground rules in a private written document before Biden accepted the position. And this ha these haven't been published before. I think they're interesting. Um, I was sent this little piece of paper with the handwriting on it. JRB and BO have weekly unstaffed meeting. JRB, for Joseph Robinette Biden, can sit in on any BO meeting. JRB must have contemporaneous receipt of all paper. All printed words that go to BO go to JRB. JRB staff must be included in any meeting with their parallel BO staff. And finally, JRB will have not have a portfolio because he will be involved in everything. And I think that that's a really critical piece of that. Um, and when I talked to, to Biden, one thing he said that was really interesting is that you know, during the Navy SEAL raid and the, bin, the raid that killed bin Laden, Joe Biden came out um, and I think has been recorded in history of being against that raid. 
Uh, and now it's hard for him. He was vice president and he said, look, I, um, th that's the job of the vice president. He, quote, you're supposed to throw yourself in front of the train. That's one of the reasons I didn't want to do it in the first place. So he came out and said, look, Oh, President Obama made this decision on his own, and I didn't necessarily support it at the time. But now if Biden wants to run for office, that could be a bad thing for him. So it's very interesting how being involved and a part of that dynamic can sometimes hurt your own um, political aspirations. Uh, one thing about Biden and Obama, they became closer over their eight years together, which is really unusual. Every other relationship uh, got significantly worse over the years. Um, the Barbara Bush and Nancy Reagan did not get along very well. I have a story in the book about how when the scathing biography came out about Nancy Reagan, Barbara Bush bought it and put a different cover on it so that Nancy Reagan wouldn't know what she was reading. They had a difficult relationship, but Bush and Reagan uh, had, a, had a very good professional relationship the entire time, although Bush always really admired Reagan's um, speaking ability. And Bush's chief of staff told me a great story where Reagan offered to coach Bush on how he could be a better speaker, and they're sitting in the Oval Office, and Reagan just took a Vanity Fair that was lying on the table and started reading it like it was a speech, like he had memorized it. And, uh, and Bush was always unable to really, um, to really compete with that. Um, I interviewed Dan Quayle for the book. Quayle, of course, had a really difficult vice presidency. Part of that was because Bush picked him without telling anybody about it. In fact, he whispered his choice to Ronald Reagan right before he got on the plane to New Orleans where he announced Quayle as his running mate. People in the crowd didn't even recognize Quayle. Um, people on Bush's staff didn't originally immediately recognize him to bring him up on stage. Um, and he was torn apart in the press, and it was a very difficult time. But he told me, look, I had a good run. I came close. I didn't get the brass ring, because of course he wanted to be president. But this was as close as he would ever get, and that's not a bad thing to be vice president and to have that kind of influence. Um, I, of course, have a section in the book about the Clintons and the Gores. Uh, Al Gore was, um, he, he is definitely out there and you hear a lot about him on climate change, but he was a really difficult interview to get for this book because he doesn't like to talk about his vice presidency because of how it ended. Losing the election in 2000 um, was very painful for him. Um, I asked Tipper Gore about it. Uh, I asked her if she actually felt like it was a relief in some way that they didn't win, and she said no. <laughs> it was, it's still very upsetting that they didn't win, and they've since separated, and the, their, cho their, their personal lives are kind of torn apart by it because it is such a um, huge disappointment. And I have stories about uh, the Lewinsky scandal and how that affected his uh, campaign and there is still, he, even though this seems like ancient history, a lot of debate among people whether or not he should have used Bill Clinton more in that election. He didn't even send Clinton to Arkansas and that really maybe could have helped him, but hindsight is 2020. Um, Tipper Gore was especially upset about Monica Lewinsky because they had a daughter her exact same age and so that was not uh, something she was particularly happy about. But Al Gore told me for almost all those eight years, the relationship was one between brothers. That may be a cliche, and I run the risk of overstatement, but really we became extremely close. So that's why uh, the end of it was so painful. I did ask him to talk about Hillary Clinton. Um, this is after the um, 2016 election. He said he called Hillary Clinton after the election to, uh, to commiserate with her because he had also lost. Um, and how, how painful that experience is. And then I asked him what it was like to work in a White House with such a powerful First Lady. And he said, and this was on the phone, so I couldn't see his face, but he said, um, I think our interview is almost over. <laughs> so that tells you how much Al Gore wants to talk about those years. Uh, this is, of course, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. It's a great photo because just imagine, you know, Bill Clinton was later uh, quoted in a book saying, you know, I think, I think Al Gore was more angry about it than, than my own wife um, because it hurt his own political uh, chances. I love this photo probably because it also has some residents.
uh, this vibes going on in it. It's the elevator at the White House residence. Um, and here is Bush and Cheney, and I think it speaks a lot to their relationship and how it really did unravel over the years. And uh, Scooter Libby was really the reason, uh, at least if you ask Cheney, one of the main reasons for that. But he said, look, Bush knew how to do the job better in the second term. There was a point in 2004 where Bush was considering replacing Cheney. Bush, you know, Cheney, and I think that, I mean, this is, of course, well known, but Cheney was the head of Bush's search team trying to find a vice president for him. So there's a great scene where the two of them are going over binders of information in Texas, and Bush turns to Cheney and says, you know, you're really the person I want to do this. And Cheney had to be convinced. First of all, he had, I believe it was two drunk driving convictions that he talks openly about. Um, he told Bush, you know, I, I flunked out of Yale. I have these convictions. My daughter is gay. Like, there are so, I have so much baggage. Um, but Bush knew that he needed um, somebody who had such a huge amount of experience. And I think that's what. I think that's why Cheney was so interesting to talk to for this book, is that here's somebody who knew Nixon personally, worked for Gerald Ford, could talk, was in Congress, worked for Bush 41. I mean, he just had a huge amount of information and historical perspective. Um, and it was also interesting to me talking to Joe Biden about Dick Cheney. I asked him what their relationship was like, and he said that he always really respected Dick Cheney. He said, um, give me back the neocons any day, because Cheney really believed what he thought he was doing was right, regardless of uh, you know what your opinion might be of it. Um, and he was trying to make the point, I think, that his relationship with the current administration is not as good as it was um, with Cheney and and even Bush and and how how different it is now. Um, this is funny because the specific story between uh, of this photo has to do with Barack Obama being shocked that Joe Biden was able to keep his speech under ten minutes at an event. And um, there is a great story that that Joe Biden told me about how he. Um, at, he wouldn't tell me what it was, which I would love to know, is that Michelle Obama approached Joe Biden towards the end of their time in the White House and asked him to talk to Barack Obama about something very personal. And she said, um, you know, everybody's always wanted something from my husband his whole adult life. You're the only person that doesn't really want anything from him, and I need you to talk to him about something. And Biden told me that it, it brought to light how he had this huge Irish Catholic family, and Barack Obama you know, did not have a big family, was raised by a single mom, um, and how there were times in his childhood that were very lonely. And I think that the two of them were really drawn together, and their friendship really was genuine. I was surprised how that I was surprised that it was not easy at the beginning. I always thought that they got along well from the very start, but Biden said that his mother, who was 90 at the time, had to convince him to take the job. He didn't really want to be vice president. Um, you know, his chief of staff told me that there was tension between the Biden's staff and the Obama staff at the beginning because, um, you know, there was some jealousy there. Biden did not do well in the, the primary. And here you get this, this young guy almost out of nowhere compared to somebody who was in the Senate for almost 40 years who felt he had really done his time. But then the two of them really complimented each other. And I have stories in the book about how um, specific stories, you know, tragedies like um, Sandy Hook and then uh, what happened at the nightclub in Florida. Um, that brought them together because Biden, having lost his wife and his daughter early on, um, right when he became a senator, is really able to connect with people very emotionally, and he wears his heart on his sleeve. And I interviewed Valerie Jarrett, who is very close with the Obamas, and she said sometimes it can be uncomfortable because Biden will just come up and hug people, and it makes it, it can make people uh, feel slightly awkward. Whereas Obamas. They would call, they called him Mr. Spock in the White House. And um, Biden said he had so much gray matter, which is that part of your brain that just, he's, he's thinking all the time. And Biden said he overthought a lot and that Biden would have to be the one, he said, to kind of 
um, tell him to trust his gut, which is what he did with the bin Laden raid, he, he said. Um, so I think that's really an interesting um, dynamic between Biden and Obama, two men that are from really different backgrounds and how they came together. Of course, in the book, I have to have Pence and Trump. So there is a chapter um, about Pence walking this tightrope, really, with Donald Trump. Um, I was really surprised that Melania Trump um, was involved um, in picking Mike Pence because she gives the impression of someone who's not engaged in politics at all. But um, I was told by someone who was in the room at the time that during this final decisive meeting in Bedminster, New Jersey, at their golf club, uh, before Pence was picked, Melania, all the elder Trump children were gathered. Um, Donald Trump, of course, was there. And she said, we need somebody who's clean. So we don't want Chris Christie or Newt Gingrich. We want somebody with no, none of the baggage that those men have. She realizes and still realizes that her husband, uh, regardless of your opinion of him politically, does carry a certain amount of controversy and baggage with him. So having Newt Gingrich as Donald Trump's vice president, you know, between them they'd have six wives. It would just maybe not have been the best choice. And she very astutely said, you need someone like Mike Pence. And he has been a very good vice president for Donald Trump. He's a really, um, I have some stories in the book about how he almost, he acts as like a translator for Trump on foreign trips. And when foreign leaders come to him, he was at an event in Venezuela, and this was early on in the Trump presidency when there was talk of military action, the, the president threatened military action in South America. And these uh, leaders in Venezuela asked Mike Pence, is this going to happen? Are you going to invade our country? What's happening? And Mike Pence said, no, no, no. Don't pay attention to the tweets. This is what he really means. And he probably could be meaning a naval blockade. It, it's not, it's not, you know, the tweeting is not necessarily what he's thinking. Um, and so Mike Pence helps to bring down the temperature a little bit. Um, I like the photo of Mike Pence, Walter Mondale, um, and Joe Biden, and, and this is in the um, uh, old executive office building next door to the White House. And, um, and Mike Pence does have good relationships, absolutely, with uh, both of these men and does seek their advice from time to time. Uh, I love this John Adams quote, I am vice president, in this I am nothing, but I may be everything. And I think one of the reasons why Mike Pence's favorite vice president is George H.W. Bush is because he's the last vice president who was able to, to really use the vice presidency to launch himself uh, into the highest office in the country. So um, with that, I would love to, to take questions if you have any about any of these uh, men. Well, there are a few women thrown in there. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. I wanted to continue with that arc that you described. I think the perception is that the vice president, once they're picked and chosen, and we all see them, has aspirations to take the presidency at some point, and now we know that's not likely to happen from a probability perspective. I'm curious, your discussions with these vice presidents, some of them said yes, that's why they wanted to join. Others said no, I'm not even interested in the job. How was the, the different arcs that occurred from that, and also what did you see in regards to after they left and did not pursue a presidency, the directions that they went on with their lives? That's a good question, because the only one of those six men who I interviewed about the job, who are the only living vice presidents who said they didn't want it, was Dick Cheney. You know, they all wanted it. Um, they, you know, Walter Mondale ran and lost in 84. Um, Bush won. There's really no, a quail really wanted it. Biden certainly, and might still run. Um, so, you know, I think that they, they kind of go into retirement <laughs> kicking and screaming. I don't think they're happy about that. Like, I, I don't think it's a great, I think that's why um, Dick Cheney really wants to be useful to Mike Pence. I got the sense that he's also very interested in talking to reporters. He's very interested in building his legacy too. Um, separate from President Bush's. Um, and so I, I can't think of a, a single instance aside from Dick Cheney where there was really, especially of the men in my book um, who I interviewed who didn't want that job. And you're right, the probability is low. But for someone like Mike Pence who could have lost in um, Indiana that governor's race, 
it makes sense to take the to roll the dice. I Thank think. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm I'm finding the book to be very interesting, and I've also read your previous books as well, which I've also found to be interesting. One thing I was wondering is. During your research, were there any particularly interesting story? Were there any were, were there any stories about Lyndon Johnson as vice president that you found to be particularly interesting? One story that I found interesting, um, I'm not sure how well known it is, but a story about him inviting a camel driver. Yeah, I love that story too. Um, he went to. Uh, in Pakistan, and he invited this camel driver back to the White House. Um, he befriended this guy over there, brought him back, and of course, this is sad because Lady Bird Johnson, LBJ wasn't there at the time, so Lady Bird Johnson kind of had to lead him through the White House um, and introduce him to the president. It was a big story at the time, and it was about kind of Johnson um, thought it would be a helpful thing, I think, for his own you know, presidential aspirations to kind of bring this uh, fellow to the U.S. and show him around. It was like a feel-good story. He also got a, Johnson got a horse for Caroline Kennedy, um, even though the last thing they needed was another horse. Um, so there are funny stories. I mean, I think that Johnson, who had been, of course, this lion in the Senate who was, um, I believe it was the youngest Senate um, majority leader. I mean, he was incredibly powerful. I have to double check that. But um, and of course, it was the Johnson treatment where he would loom over people to get them to do what he wanted and kind of use his physical presence to do that. And then he gets to the White House, and the Kennedy staff treats him like dirt. I mean, they called him Uncle Cornpone. Um, just thought he was a rube in a lot of ways and ignored him and there's stories of him at cocktail parties where you would oh, people would say who is that oh it's just the vice president you know no need to talk to him so it really took him down a notch and I think the vice presidency was a really painful time for Lyndon Johnson but um, and and it was also difficult for Kennedy because he felt, there's a story in the book about how Kennedy felt he had to pick Johnson to win the South. And I love that chapter about Robert Kennedy trying to persuade Johnson not to take the job because he hated Johnson so much. Um, but there's an amazing, uh, Robert Caro's books on Johnson, I think there are three of them, right, that are just really, really detailed and have go into the vice presidency deeply. But thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not thinking um, politically. Of all the people, the, the presidents, the vice presidents, and the first ladies, who did you find the most interesting? That's such a oh, that's such a hard question to answer. I think oh, of all the vice presidents, presidents, and first ladies, I mean, the people I had access to were really this the vice presidents and the staff. If I could interview anybody right now who would have a lot to say, would be um, the head housekeeper at the White House who's still there. And that would be a great story. <laughs> thank you. Hi, thank you. I, I served in the George Herbert Walker Bush oh. White House, and I, I really thought you uh, captured him pretty well. Thank you. Uh, in reading David Moranis's book, uh, uh, Richard Nixon took a hard look at Vince Lombardi for vice president. Oh, really? um, so who were some of the more interesting would have been vice presidential selections that you came across? Uh, that's a really good question. Well, I know that Donald Trump was looking at Michael Flynn. That would have been interesting. Um, and in fact, I talked to A.B. Culvehouse, who led Trump's search, and he really said that that was something that they had to convince Trump not to do. And that, and, and Culvehouse says he, he is so upset. He led McCain's search, so Sarah Palin, um, that he's upset thinking about how there's no FBI vetting for vice presidents or presidents, which I thought I never thought of that before, um, that you have more vetting as a cabinet secretary than you do um, as vice president or president. Um, you know, I don't know if there's anybody that comes to mind who I was really shocked by. I think I do think the lineup for Trump was interesting. Um, I thought Michael Bloomberg was interesting, but that's not like a Vince Lombardi crazy um, thought. Um, 
But I think if you go back, I mean, a lot, there were always like a handful of contenders, um, you know, like Bob Dole and people like that who were always on a list. But in my research, I didn't find anything quite as interesting as that. I did think that Michael Bloomberg, um, he was passed up by Obama, even in the very beginning stages, because there's these, all these controversies surrounding him um, when he was at Bloomberg, um, and all this like sexual harassment stories and allegations and stuff. And I thought that was really interesting. But thank you. Anyone else? How many women have been genuine contenders for the vice presidency? Well, Geraldine Ferraro um, was Walter Mondale's um, pick, and that would have been really amazing. And actually, that was an interesting story because I interviewed people who worked for Mondale who talked about how it changed everything because here you have to vet the husband. You know, and this doesn't, I don't mean to make this sound sexist at all, but a lot of the men who were running. Um, who are considered as vice president, their wives were housewives or, you know, stay-at-home moms, and there wasn't a lot of financial um, entanglements or things to worry about. But Geraldine Ferraro's husband was, you know, and Diane Feinstein's husband also. Um, there was a lot of controversy there about what their husbands did for a living and their real estate investments, and so it became once you had a woman, a female candidate, you had to vet her husband too. Um, and I thought that was interesting and also kind of sad because it hadn't occurred to me before that that, that wasn't really usually a concern for the male candidates. I also thought one of the more interesting things was Sarah Palin. Um, the lawyers asked her, one of the questions they asked her, and this was in 2008 before the Bin Laden raid, one of their standard questions for VPs, and those questions are interesting, there are over 100 of them, um, was if you could kill bin Laden, but there would be a lot of you know, mass casualties, um, would you take the shot? And she said, yes, I would, and then I would go down on my hands and knees and pray to God for forgiveness. And the lawyers who were doing the vetting at the time just said, that is brilliant. So that's one of the reasons why they picked Sarah Palin. Um, and also it's the kind of, she talked about her daughter being pregnant and, and that was something she said over the phone. So I find the whole, like I have a chapter called The Art of the Vet in the book, which is about vetting and the process and how secretive it is and how things like a teenage pregnancy, um, vetting vice presidential, you know, women, I mean, it's more controversial. Some of the questions that you ask men would be, have you had an affair? You would ask a woman that too, but you know, have you been sexually harassed? Have you sexually harassed anybody? I mean, it just changes the dynamic and most of the lawyers are men still. And so I talked to some of them who've led past searches and they said when they interviewed Sarah Palin, for instance, they always made sure that there was another woman in the room so they would feel comfortable asking some of these really, really personal questions of a woman. Um, just because of the dynamic there of a man asking the questions. And I just thought that was interesting and hopefully we'll see more <laughs> women run for office and that won't be, and more women lawyers in those positions to ask questions. But um, I thought that was interesting and in how kind of disarming Sarah Palin was for them and how like the force of her personality, um, you know, because the person who was in charge of vetting and who picked Sarah Palin is really not apologetic about it at all, even though there are polls that show she did cost John McCain um, a lot of votes. But he said that, you know, she could fill a room. I mean, she was just amazing. And so it's just interesting because I think that um, it, as more women sort of get into office and positions of power, I think they're going to have to look at vetting a little differently. There is the issue of health records, and this surfaced with the Eagleton affair, and uh, Truman might have had a different, re uh, how, whether Truman was certain that he would, that Roosevelt would not live out his fourth term is debated, but to what extent should the health records of the, vi the potential candidate for vice president be uh, a, a legitimate part of the vetting process? Well, that's a good question. It's just one that's more opinion-based. Um, I think that Eagleton talking about his mental health problems, um, and I think he talked about electroshock therapy and some things at the time that were really controversial, I think would be slightly less controversial today. But I still think if someone came out and talked about having a history of depression, that would still be um, an issue in the press. <coughs> 
um, because of how we kind of stigmatize mental health. Um, But so I don't know, that's more of an opinion driven thing. I mean, that was the entire reason why he dropped out was because of of that coming to light and how embarrassing it was and humiliating. I think things have changed a bit, but I still think, um, I still think if you had a vice presidential candidate who came out and talked about a history of depression, it would be a liability and that you'd have to do it right at the very beginning of the campaign. Um, But a lot of it's really secretive and there are, you know, there are, I asked one of the head vetters, uh, lawyers, these are white collar lawyers, and he said being a a vetting attorney is like being a cross between um, an FBI agent and a voyeur. You know, like you get to talk to people about affairs and any, I mean, very personal questions. And they go and travel to their hometown and like dig up things, and it's really fun. They, uh, the people who volunteer to do it, do it for free, which I also think is interesting. And, um, a Donald Trump staff was not, Paul Manafort thought that he'd have to pay for it and they came to it really, really late, which I also thought was interesting. So they came to the vice presidential selection process later than usual and they asked a law firm much later than usual and didn't kind of know how it worked, which I think says a lot about how kind of they're outside the beltway maybe thinking, I'm not sure. But um, so the vetting is, is really fascinating, but I still think mental health, I still think that would be a liability for someone. Whether it should or not, I don't, I don't know, but um, I still think it would be an issue. Anybody else? No? Well, thank you so much for coming and, and for inviting me, David. Thank you guys. Thank you. Folks, there's a book signing.